it's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing- You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. Yeah, well, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine, I will listen, fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just don't try to see things my way. Do I have to keep on talking to So what is the problem? Some of you say it's the nail, but let's look something, at something deeper, because I think there are two essential problems. One of them, the male, is a fixer. So whenever there's a problem in the relationship, what does he try to do? Fix it. In fact, if you ask him if the relationship is doing well, if there's nothing to fix, we're fine. I have friends that are this way. They have no clue that their marriage has been spiraling down and down and down because it doesn't appear that anything's wrong. So if there's nothing to fix, we're fine. What he wants to do is he wants to speak truth into a place where there's a problem. And what does she want? What is her problem? She wants to be a, have a partner in it. It's not just about the problem. It's about knowing me. What she wants is to have her feelings valued. That's a really good point. Is it true that the nail should probably be removed? Yeah. Is it equally true that she should be heard and validated? Yes. How do we do both? Today we're going to lean in on communication because maybe more than anything else, communication makes us, and I'll tell you this, communication also breaks us. And if you want something different in your marriage, if you want something different in your relationship with your kids, different at work, this is key. What you do with how you speak and how you listen changes everything. One of the things we've laid as a baseline for this series is that our culture and our home is ultimately decided by the things that we elevate and the things that we tolerate. For that woman who is willing to tolerate a nail in her head, it's creating a problem in the culture of their home. And what we elevate, the things that we're willing to put our time and our money and our effort into, is exactly what will make our home our home. So today we're going to look at how we can communicate. I want to give a little caution just on how this sermon will go. This is very different than a normal sermon here at Family Church. Usually when Paul or I get up here, we will take God's word and we will have the topic at hand. We will have one scripture that we will come from. Mark 4, Acts 17. And we'll basically teach through that text and we may have some supporting verses. Well, today as we were looking at the heartbeat of communication, there is no chapter on marriage communication in its entirety of what we wanted to look at. And there's not necessarily the great example for how we wanted to put it out. So what we're going to do is we're going to do three mini sermons, but we're going to have to take parts of a verse. And what I want you to know is you can't ever take a verse and just pull it out of context. That's how cults get started. So to make sure that we have a full understanding of all of the chapter that we're not going to teach here, on your devotions, that's the backside of your outline, there are those chapters. And my challenge for you is to read them in their entirety this week. So as we look at this too— the other component is most of the New Testament was written to churches about how they were relating to themselves. And we've noticed something, that how a church is supposed to relate to itself is echoes out in the family. And what you model at church is modeled in the family. And what you do in your family comes out at church. So as we look at these verses, they're written specifically to churches about how they'll relate. 
but we're going to look at the underlying principle. Whenever we're reading the text, we're looking for the underlying principle and saying, can this and how does this fit in our marriages, in our parenting, in how we relate to our parents, in all of those. So the first one we're going to be in, we're going to be in Hebrews 10. Hebrews is a book written to a Jewish church, and in the midst of that, they were dealing with some things, how they were communicating, how they were connected with each other, very similar to how many of our families and our homes can feel broken. <laughs> so we're going to pick this up, Hebrews 10, and this is in verse 24 is where we're going to start. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards good love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. A couple things to, to notice here. Consider you have to have a focused idea of how you will be a part of spurring others on. There's a, there's a desire to say, I'm all in. I'm focused on this. And the next thing that I notice is it says, do not give up meeting together. You can see that that happens in a church. You know, you get busy and you stop coming. In fact, this initial thing, the reason that they were writing this was because uh, in that first century, they had just come up with a live stream where it was on video and you could stay at home and watch church online. And so when you can watch church online, keep your slippers on. There's no need to go. And so they had to write this letter saying, hey, don't just watch church online. Because look what it says. Don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. It's hard to encourage one another when you're at home on your couch. And you know, there are people that needed a hug and they weren't, you're not there. So for those of you watching online, it's a little bit of an encouragement. Don't forget there are people that are a part of that. Now, think about this in terms of the home though. Do families end up, stop meeting together? You bet. You know why? Because we're busy. And what I meant by saying busy, I said, we're Americans. And you're busy with soccer, and we're busy with work, and we're busy with uh, knitting uh, groups. We're busy with, you name it, we've got a group for it. We're also busy because there's now, this, and this is a wonderful thing, there's football on on Thursday night, there's football on on Friday night, there's football all day Saturday, there's football all day Sunday, and there's football Monday night. And we haven't even gotten to the fact that the World Series is on. Go Dodgers, Okay. <laughs> I'm busy. I don't have time to communicate with my kids. I don't have time to communicate with my wife. But notice, it says don't give up meeting together. When was the last time your family had dinner together? First thing I want you to write down. If you want connection, this is a baseline. You will have to make a connection. And I'll give you a little hint. Now, this is totally un-American. In fact, Congress will probably come after me. This is not a mode of connection. Oh, that's cool. They went to the beach. Oh, that's interesting. Knowing what people are doing because they've posted it is not the same thing as connecting. So the first thing I want to challenge us on is the idea of spending time. I wrote that and then I realized the word spending was there and I hadn't caught it. That's really an economic term. It's how you use time. What parameters do you have in your home to make sure that there is time for family, that there's time for connection, that there's time for the marriage, that there's time for time with the kids, that there's time to make the call so that you can connect with your mother-in-law or your father-in-law, or you can call dad, or that you can make sure that you're staying connected. Is there, are there any parameters that say this matters? And we're going to limit how many outside things. We were talking about this. As far as a church, our goal is to never expect more than three hours a week where you guys would be at any type of church event. Because we want you to have connection at the church, but we also want you to have time so that you can connect with your family, so that you can have devotions with your family, so that you don't... When I was growing up, and this is basically how I felt the church was as a whole, you could tell you were spiritual if you were at church and really busy. So if you were at church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, visitation on Tuesday, then you had another thing on Thursday, come all back and we'll do, do it again all next week. Busyness was the goal. And we want to say, man, I would much rather say, here's what we're going to do at Family Church, but we're going to make sure that we're going to block that out so there's also time to go for a walk with your wife. Now here's the, the dangerous thing. Family Church can do what it can do, but we can't make it where you're going to choose your wife over sports. And we can't make it where you're going to choose your husband over kids and soccer. How you choose to use your time is so critical. And if you want to make connection with them, let me give you a couple pieces of, of advice. You need to know how they feel connected to. Because I'll tell you, and this is generally speaking more of a male thing. But if we sit here, male there, male here, and we just face each other, 
It's just awkward, man. We don't like it. You know what we'd rather do? We'd rather grab a shovel and dig a ditch or grab a video game system and play something. We like to be side by side, generally speaking. Other genders, there's only one, the other gender may generally speak say, hey, let's go face to face in our dialogue. Well, if you look at this, do you know what works best for your spouse and for your kids? Is it playing a game with your kid or pushing them on the swing or being with them going for a walk? You have to know how the time is most effective. Also, it's amazing how much your heart feels safer if you just simply have a cup of coffee in front of you. That's why Starbucks exists. It's a place for people to sit and feel safe with a cup of coffee talking about things that are deeper. So number one, spending time. The second one is how do you encourage hearts? Notice what he said, spur one another on, encouraging them, moving them. Do you know how to encourage someone? The first thing that you're going to need is you're going to need specifics. Because if you're going to encourage them, just saying, hey, I like you. You're really nice. Wow, you have made my day. But if you're going to say something encouraging, you can specifically say, here is a component in your life that I appreciate about you. And two ways that you can do this. One of them is to actually go to the person that you're trying to connect with and say it to them. Here's what I appreciate about you. There's another mode that I think would be really, really powerful for you. If you got yourself, here's, some of you don't know, there's a new technology that's come out. It's called the U.S. Postal Service. Now, the U.S. Postal Service allows you to write down those words of encouragement on a piece of paper. You can fold it, put it in an envelope, put an address on there and a stamp. You put it in a mailbox. They will pick it up and bring it back to your house. You're going to pay them to take it so they hold it for like five days, and then they bring it back. And you, you know how meaningful it is when you get a card from someone that's in your family that mailed it to you, and you open that. They're not even home. You open it, and it says, hey, this is what I appreciate about you. I'm so grateful that you're a part of our family. How much better we are because you're in this. It can be someone that you're married to. It can be someone that's your kid. You could do it for your parents. But do you know how to encourage the people that are in your family? home. Now realize the baseline for everything else we're going to talk about in your relationships comes with this in mind. You have to have connection. If they don't feel heart connected, and, and listen to this, let's go back to the nail. If she doesn't feel heard, she's not going to feel safe to have the nail removed. The nail is not the only issue. Hearts matter too. So if you don't realize that connection matters and all you have to do is think, I, my only job is to provide or to keep it clean or whatever the roles that you've put into your family. If you don't realize it's more than that, you will ultimately never be able to accomplish the next two. Because in reality, people have nails in their head. Not really. But figuratively speaking, there are problems. Do you know how to look someone in the eye and say, I need to help share something with you? There's a problem, and we have to fix it. So we're going to talk about how to challenge. About three years ago, uh, I met someone that became a very dear friend. And every Tuesday at noon, I go for a walk around Sutherland with him. In fact, if you're driving around Sutherland, especially around on Central Area, you'll probably see my buddy Zach and I. We uh, have been connected for about three years. Two and a half years ago, he came on staff. And one of the things that I saw him do is he, uh, he did one of those trainings for leaders, group leaders, that kind of made me mad because he totally blew my mind and I was frustrated because now I have to live out this thing that he's talking about. And he was challenging on us, how do we see the nail and in a healthy way help remove the nail? So, Zach, come on up. He's going to help share this with us. Thanks, bud. Will gets the fluff of connection and I get challenged. How is that fair? All right, but what we're going to do, we're going to look in Ephesians. And so Paul is writing in Ephesians to the church of Ephesus, all right? So we're going to look at a passage in Ephesians 4. Today, just think of it as the uh, Ephesians 4 principle once we get started. But instead, <coughs> speaking the truth in love, right, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. So, truth and love causes growth and causes unity, right? So love that's it. for the church and that's for home. So, on your outline, the back side where it says notes, there's a chart. I want you to work from that for a little bit. 
So how do we do this? What I'm, you're saying that these two components have to be there, truth and love. Yeah, equal parts. But in any moment, we bend towards one or the other. So give, me, give it to me. So someone who's heavy in truth, who's that? You're watching the video and thinking, it's, there's a nail in your forehead, right? We're speaking truth and no love is there. I'll give you an example from my life. Man, I had a long week. I was putting in the hours, mm -hmm. Will. Long hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of people. I was exhausted. So, come home. At this time, um, my kids, we only had two kids at the time. We had a newborn baby, and we had a little one that liked to be the little hurricane around the house. So, I come home from work, walk in the door. It is a mess. There's clothes everywhere. There's dishes piled up. Uh, my wife has spit up on her shoulder. Uh, still in her pajamas, hasn't showered, and I'm like, the house is a mess. Uh-oh. Yeah. I'm going to go walk away from this one. Yeah. Did, you see the, did you see the look on their faces when yeah. you said that? Yeah. It was classic. Yeah, holster your elbows, ladies. Um, <laughs> but you gave truth. What was the problem? Was it a mess? Uh, it was not, yes. It was not truth in love. It was truth in Stupidity. <laughs> uh. Very good. So, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Save your amens for another time. All right. <laughs> Truth. So give me the other way. Because this sounds like this is where we should be. Does, raise your hand if you think there should be more love in relationships. Okay, put your hands down because you're going to get it now. All right, here we go. Give us a love sign. I'm with all of you love people. Actually, outside of that, that moment, I mean, I never do that again. Um, I tend to be down here. Um. <sighs> so on this loved one, it's not the nail. It, there's more than the nail here. Mm -hmm. Just hear me. Right? Just, just being heard? Just hear me. Well, what happens in a, in a relationship where this, this comes out? Like when it's all love and no... Yeah, here's how this played out in my life and probably the most serious example. Um, I had a friend in grade school. His name was John. John did not... Um, he was not a Christian... But he went to church with me every week. Um, in junior high, John started hanging out with a different crowd and started partying. Uh, do you know what I did? Nothing. I just went, went and hung out with other people. And John right now is serving about 15 years in the state penitentiary. And I don't know if my words of truth would have impacted him, but you know what? I will never know. Mm -hmm. If I could have steered him in a different direction. So as you play this out, you've got truth and you've got love. If, what I hear you saying is the Ephesians 14 would be that we're high in both. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? It looks like hearing what is more than the nail. Mm -hmm. And then in love saying, help me remove that. Got it. Well, um, raise your hand if you're more of a truth person. That's going to be me. Okay. Okay. Um, you know you're a truth person because your spouse just went, that's you. Okay? Yeah, if you're wondering, ask your spouse. But yeah. Uh, yeah. You're probably not wondering. <laughs> well, those of you that are love, you've been that way? Okay. What happens if you're extreme truth? Explain that to us. Hmm. Focused on yourself in pride, you become critical. I bet you feel this. I, for those of you that have taken Love and Logic and you've been a part of that parenting class, this is a helicopter parent. Okay, they're going to rescue. This is a drill sergeant parent. This is a consultant. It's basic, basic idea there, but this critical nature. You were telling me that the, the clearest sign that you have two truth people in a marriage, what does that look like? You're arguing all the time. Because you're both telling truth. You got a nail. Shut up. You got your own nail. Let me tell you about your yeah, nail. Your nail's bigger than my <laughs> nail. You don't even know. Right? Yeah. So, so then you end up with critical and you end up with conflict. Well, what happens on the, the love side? Where does that go? Focused on ourselves in fear, we become enabling. So this is focused on yourself and this is focused on yourself. This is about pride, but this one's more about fear. We, we use the word love, but really what you're saying is there's a fear. Explain the fear. The fear is the loss of relationship a lot of times. That if I tell them the truth, they won't, they'll leave. You're going to lose the relationship. Yeah. You were telling me about a family that you are in connection with 
where they had 20 years without any conflict. Raise your hand if you like the idea of marriage without conflict. Raise your hand. Okay. And then what happens? All right. So even though we're loved because we're not stating truth, as, as a love guy, I, I keep track. So all you love people, we keep track of the wrongs that have happened. And a family that we're, I'm very close to, uh, the first time they fought in 20 years was her filing the divorce papers and him signing it. So you have two people that are, and we call it love, but let's just use fear for right now. When you're, you're low here, it's fear. So these two fear slash love people wouldn't ever tell the truth until 20 years later, they said, okay, it's over. Yeah. Heartbreaking. Well, what does it look like when you go back to the verse, Ephesians 4? What did, it, what did the church in Ephesus look like then when you brought it together? Discipleship. This is where authenticity happens. This is where maturity is. I thought of this after we were done. Um, if you're in life group and you're doing uh, the family series uh, curriculum, this makes us. One of the things I've noticed is how David responded. How many of you feel schizophrenic with this, where sometimes you're this and sometimes you're that? Totally that way. David is totally this way. When it came to leading the nation, he was a truth teller. He was a warrior. He wasn't afraid of anybody. You give me a giant, I'll take him down. Truth. Then you looked at how he related to his family. He's a train wreck. You know why? He wouldn't stand up to his son Absalom. He wouldn't stand up to anybody. Just, eh, it's not really worth it. Let it go, right? What if he had moved to that direction? So as we um, play this out, how do you move from being a love person? Give me some practical steps. How do, I, how do I do it? What do they need? Look, courage. Mm. Courageously speaking the truth. And what I need as a love person, is to actually look that this is not just affecting me. There's a truth that they need to fix other relationships as well, to help them develop. It's mm -hmm. in their own good. And when I am focused on them and not my fear, I move to tell truth. I was just thinking as you were saying that one of the things that will probably bring the greatest peace for you to be able to tell the truth if this is a really scary thing, if you know that your identity is in Jesus and that even if they do leave you. I know that Jesus loves me, and that's more than enough. It's easier to step into this. If your security of who you are as a person is so tied with the person you're afraid is going to leave, it's going to be really hard to have this kind of courage. And what about truth? How do I move that way? Seriously, for me, tell me. How do I move towards this? Grace. Okay. Grace. And we... Grace. You don't say the house is a mess. You... <laughs> You graciously look at the heart of the person you're talking to and you try to make sure that is secure, that the heart is secure. So if you see the nail in your spouse's or kid's forehead, how do you navigate making sure that the heart is okay so that we can remove the nail, the essence of it, right? Yeah, because in Ephesians 4 principle, the truth in love, we are trying to have someone actually have ears to hear us. Mm -hmm. And the only way is combining both things. We've seen this uh, in those times when we would go for walks around Sutherland. Uh, about six weeks ago, we were having a discussion, meaning we were disagreeing on how we should do something at church. And obviously, I was trying to tell him the truth because he's wrong. And so I'm trying to bring it to him. And finally, he says to me, Would you stop selling me, Will? Do you know why I was selling him? Once again, there was a nail. He's obviously wrong. So I was letting him know. And my response was, you know, when you say that to me, you shut me down. Do you not want me to share with you? To which his response was, So you don't want me to tell you how you're making me feel. So I just shut him down. So here's what we did. We kept walking for about a block, and neither of us said anything. And then we leaned back into the relationship, and we asked this simple question. How can I communicate with you in a way that doesn't hurt you? So you and I've caught that. How do I give grace to you? And how do we make sure that he shares with me? And I'll tell you, this is not what would have been true three years ago when we met. This is actually the two of us growing in the truth and love side. So, grow in courage and grow in grace, and you'll live out the Ephesians 4 principle. Yeah. Thanks, Zach. Thank you. So as we move forward on this, we've talked about how you have to, it's the baseline has to be connection. And then out of that, we can actually be a part of discipling each other. What would it look like if when I have a problem, there's a sin issue in me, if my children 
could actually tell me, Dad, there's a problem. Because at an early age, we were teaching our kids to speak truth and love. What would it look like if my spouse could actually say, hey, this is a problem? It would transform the way that we function as a family. Think of how different this idea, this makes us. In 2023, in five years, if truth and love were the two highest priorities in our conversations, where those of us who bend towards love would step into courage and be willing to say, you don't see this, but there's a huge booger in your nose and I'm not afraid to tell you. And conversely, those people who are all about truth would learn to qualify their remarks and lean back in. But either way, you're gonna end up with a couple problems. One of them is that you have to have that baseline of trust. And when you have trust, you'll be able to move forward. The second thing that you need as a component for a healthy challenge is you have to have proper timing. When you get home, the house is a mess and there is a battle scar on the shoulder. That is not the time. Also, just as a general rule, if you go to bed at 9, 8.58 is a really bad time to try and talk it out. All right? Don't bring up your challenge at inopportune times. Think it through. And for some, if they're more of a slower processor, you might want to say, hey, tomorrow afternoon, can we talk about what the plan is? And then the final one is tone. It's tact. It's how you say it. I'll give you a, a couple of hints. And I'm going to talk to guys for a second. Is it generally speaking? If, let me say it this way. If you're one of the more aggressive guys, one of the things that may have an impact, especially if you're taller than your spouse, if you simply sit down, it may help that person feel safer. Number two, talk slower. Number three, don't raise your voice. By the way, she's in the room. You don't actually have to raise your voice. She can hear you. It's usually a communication problem. Tone matters. Also, if you're on the other side and you're not really that aggressive, you may bend towards being passive aggressive. That will kill it just as much. How do you say it in a clear way? You know, uh, Proverbs is so great at how to um, handle relationships. Proverbs 15.1, listen to this. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Harshness, the tone, that component, if it's not said kindly, may never be heard. Next thing I want us to talk through is as we talk about challenge and we've talked about that deeper connection, what happens when the fuse is lit the explosion has happened, there's collateral damage everywhere, and you are in the middle of a fight. What do we do with conflict? I have uh, been thinking about this for probably the last 40 years of my life. How do you handle conflict? Because conflict is inevitable in every relationship. A few years ago, a um, few years ago, 15 years ago, I was sitting at Delray Cafe with Paul, who was mentoring me at the time, and I was a, a young school teacher, and we were talking about a problem with a relationship that I had with someone that I didn't live near anymore. And I thought to myself, I don't need to have any relationship with this person at all anymore. And he said, you know, Will, I think there's a danger there. And so Paul took out a piece of paper and said, I want to show you a principle that may be killing you, and you don't know it. He said, you're here in the center of your life and then you have a sphere of influence of people around you. You have your parents, you have people you work with, you maybe have some siblings, you may have kids of your own, but you have people around you. And when you come into conflict with one of them and the lightning strikes and you don't get along with that person anymore, what you may be tempted to do is to write them off. You say, you know what? They don't live in this town or even if they do, I don't have to be near them. I'm cutting off the relationship because they hurt me and I don't know how to relate to them. And he said, well, what you don't realize is that though that person doesn't live inside this town, other people do that fit into the same category as that person that you don't get along with. And this cutting off the relationship may mean you're cutting off one quarter of the people in your life. And he said that to me and I realized that in the back of the room, the, the class that I was teaching used to be a history teacher. There were two people and I thought to myself, they remind me of that other person. And you know what? I don't even relate to them. I write them off. And here's the interesting thing. The person that doesn't live near me, there's nothing I could do. I practiced loving that person by loving these people. And I'll tell you, if you get into this habit that when conflict comes, you just start cutting off either the relationship or that part of the relationship. If you're married to that person and you're in a fight and, and there's a conflict over a certain issue, let's say it's money, 
then from then on, you just cut off any relationship about money. And you start cutting off relationships. You start cutting off, what you're cutting off is intimacy. Because you can't have connection if you're cutting that off. Uh, we're talking last night. In essence, it ends up becoming a habit in your life. So stop and think, who's that person in your life? Maybe they live he near here, or maybe they don't. That you have either cut off, or you are tempted to cut off. How do you lean back in to the relationship? And I'll, I'll give it to you this way too. The person that I was cutting off relationship for may have similar characteristics to the person that may one day marry my son or my daughter, which means I am practicing loving my future in-law. That changes the scenario completely. Am I willing to transform the way I handle conflict? I absolutely love a certain chapter in the Bible. It's Romans 12. If you're ever going to memorize a, a chapter of the Bible, memorize Romans 12. It walks through how to relate to the church, how to relate to God, and how to relate to others. And so in conflict, I'm going to just read a verse and ask you a question. And let the Holy Spirit say what needs to change in me. Listen to this. So Romans 12, starting in verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Do not repay. If you are trying to repay, it's because you think they owe you something. And this is how, exactly how we escalate it. They do something, they say something that's cutting or hurtful. My response is to fight them back. So let me ask a question. What do they owe me? If I'm not given respect and I go to pay it back, if I go to pay the evil back, all I'm doing is pouring gasoline on a conflict. What do they owe me? Verse 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, this is an interesting component. Picture the fight. You got that, that place in your heart where the, your, your chest is, is tense and you can't stand them. If they're in the room, you just want to say something. You're in that, or you want to run from them. You don't want to be near them. How much depends on you? I know some of you are thinking, in our fights, it's like 10% mine. Then I ask you this, do you own the 10% that's yours? So play it out all the way. How much depends on me? What response will I have? The other thing that I'll say on this is, we talked about escalating whenever you're trying to repay. If you walk with a mindset that says, I will do whatever I can, whatever depends on me, you won't escalate. What is it that you do that escalates the fight? Because sometimes you simply walking out only stirs it up, or you saying snarky remarks, or you getting louder, whatever the, the relationship nature of it is, what you do in that conversation that makes it worse, what would it look like if your family didn't have that component? That depends on you. You are a key player in this game, and I know the temptation. Just talk specifically marriage for a second. I know it's all her fault. I know it's all his fault. But there's only one person that you have control over, and that's you. So how much depends on you? Verse 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Romans 12, 19, listen to this. Question, am I stepping into God's role? If you're going to make them pay, you are playing God with the relationship, and you are trying to be in control. When you are hurt, if your choice is to hurt back, you're playing the role of God. And finally, listen to this. It says, on the contrary, in opposition to the ideas you just looked at, the idea that you're going to repay and that you're going to take vengeance, in contrast, contrary to escalation, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. You know what we would rather do? Cut out the first half of this verse. How do we just do the burning coals? But I want you to imagine that you're in a fight with your spouse. And in the middle of that fight, your heart is hurting. You're damaged. You want to get them back. And instead, you say, what can I do? I can make him coffee without any poison in it. <laughs> you go and you make the coffee and you set it down. You say, here. If nothing else, it may not change his attitude, but it will work on yours. And if your wife 
can't stand you right now and you can't stand her. How powerful it is when you go into the kitchen and you say, I'm going to make her some coffee or some tea and say, here you go. It may not change them, but it depends on you. How much depends on you? I can control my voice. I can even control my emotions. Isn't this the essence of the fruit of the Spirit? That what God is doing in me is transformed that way. I'll say it this way. How you handle your hardest relationship is where you're being most like Jesus. Jesus hung on the cross and they were nailing him there and while hanging there, that's worse than anything your spouse has done to you. He says, Father, forgive them. If you want to be like Jesus, it'll come out in your hardest relationship. I got a, a challenge that we're going to look at at all three campuses. So I'm going to release to South Umqua and Sky, And I'm also going to release to Green Campus and Pastor Paul. I love you guys. Can't wait to see you. The next component has to do with this week specifically. And because this is something that all of us can do, my expectation is that all of us will do it. And it is practical and you can do it. Here's what we have. We want you to have a conversation this week, including truth and love. For some of you, this is 40 years in the making. And it's time to have the courage to have the conversation. For some of you, this will be the first time in your relationship, whether or not it's with a father, son, mother, daughter, spouse, it will be the first time you walk in and you say the truth, but you say it with gentle love. And I realize what I am asking of you. How many of you want to do this? Okay, yeah. So there's a few of you that are liars. The rest of us, I'm with you. This is not going to be fun. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, you have called us to love our enemies and sometimes the enemy lives with us. Sometimes it feels like the enemy is our kid. Sometimes it feels like the enemy is our parent. Sometimes it feels like the enemy is a neighbor. Lord, I pray that whatever that difficult relationship is, you would help us to be courageous enough to speak truth and gracious enough to speak it in love. God, I pray that you would transform the way that we see our relationships. In your name we pray. Amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here. And you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say, we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.